I just want to take this brief opportunity again to thank the Filson for um, really being the driving force behind this weekend's uh, academic conference and bringing all of these various people and perspectives into a room together here in Kentucky, which really is the, the center of the universe um, where the rivers come together. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but seriously, um, Patrick, uh, um, Dick Clay, everybody here at the, the Filson has just been incredibly wonderful and gracious and fun to work with as this whole weekend's event has pulled together. So thank you all very much um, for making this convening happen. Uh, for our final two presentations this afternoon, uh, one here in person and one uh, through the magic of technology, uh, we will continue our exploration into the early uh, American Trans-Appalachian West um, with some twists. Our first speaker will be Dr. Ben Bascom, who is Assistant Professor of English at Ball State University and who earned his PhD from the um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, our second speaker, uh, joining us via Zoom will be Philippe Halbert, uh, who is the, I want to make sure I get this right, the Richard Cooperman Associate Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum in Connecticut. And Philippe recently completed his PhD uh, at Yale. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speakers for this afternoon's panel. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the Filson for putting this together. Uh, thank you to Daniel and to Patrick for organizing such a compelling array of papers. Um, thanks for Scott for facilitating all the technology. Um, speaking of technology, I know we just finished lunch. And if you need to have something in your hand, I have some copies of my paper if you want to look at it. I do um, ask that I get the copies back. There's just four. It's just one of those things that I know that my mind is still on those amazing um, like spinach wrap things. I want more tzatziki sauce and just, I, I could eat like four more. Um, but um, so the talk I have prepared for today comes from um, a portion of my forthcoming book. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I feel a little um, narcissistic or uh, self-indulgent in a way, because this is material that I've worked on a lot, um, but also like I've never presented um, this format before. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, um, but I'm actually kind of intrigued because there's several people here who know of John Fitch, the purported inventor of the first functional steamboat. He had a ferrying business across the Delaware in Philadelphia. Um, where um, he did that for a couple of years before uh, interpersonal stuff intervened and he lost his company. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so an early 20th century postcard of Old Town Cemetery of Bardstown, K Kentucky, points out the burial spot of John Fitch, the ill-famed inventor of an 18th century steamboat who died in that town in 1798. Leafless, spindly trees stretch toward an overcast sky with a single dark stake, made of wood or metal, marking the grave, pointing up slightly off-center from the ground below one of four prominent tree trunks. At the bottom of the card, in red-orange text, are the words, Post Marking the Grave in Old Town Cemetery of John Fitch, the unhonored inventor of the first steamboat, Bardstown, Connecticut. There's nothing exceptional about the composition of the image. It resembles an ordinary late winter or early spring scene of a nondescript graveyard with sparse memorials in various states of disarray. But the text offers a curious rhetorical maneuver that honors the unhonored, making a memento to the supposedly unremembered even as that very gesture comes to mark the production of lost memory. John Fitch isn't forgotten, though, and he's not even unhonored. 
Instead, he is honored with the narrative of being forgotten and then remembered again, and in that gesture attempting to redeem all so-called forgotten failures. Monuments and memorials embed around them this dialectic of failure, where they indicate an anxiety of remembering that overcompensates for loss. The post that marks John Fitch's grave resembles in miniature the future Washington Monument, planned to tower over Federal City, offering a tiny obelisk to point out the insignificant weight of an unremembered life. The cultural shadow today, cast by the Washington Monument in the Capitol, obscures its own piecemeal and faltering construction, with drying avenues of funding and political controversies delaying its erection. The excesses to si in size inflate to epic proportions the desire to make certain that some future remembers. Indeed, the first issue of the Washington National Monument, published in 1871, a periodical pamphlet dedicated to finishing the decade-stalled project, calls such monuments, quote, the rear guards of civilization, the last witnesses of the fall of governments and of the overthrow of nations, standing on the outposts of time, solemnly protesting against the advance of the destroyer. Important here is the connecting of memorials to the trappings of an impending failed civilization, as memorials stave off anxieties about a seemingly faded future, destruction, and forgetting. Washington's monument galvanizes the desire to remember and mark as significant particular lives over others, emblazoning the famed Cincinnati Cincinnatus who becomes celebrated for his iconic and disinterested deflection. Debates over where to place the body of the deceased commander embroiled concerns regarding the security of the body. If it were left in a private resting place, early nationalists feared, some so-called foreign power would one day purchase the land. Contrarily, if the body were interred where William Thornton, the initial designer of the capital, had intended, on perpetual display in a catacomb under the figurative seat of government, such grandiose entombment seemed at variance with Republican governance. Needless to say, the places where bodies decay and what bodies are made to outlive that decay through the apparatuses of memorials resonates with long lasting ideological significance. In juxtaposing uh, Fitch's small marker, with Washington's colossal monument, I want to consider how memorials index a type of cultural failure. In a popular image of Washington's burial, actual burial site, a lone man stands before a wooden fence, hat moved in a gesture of contemplation. The picture evokes an intimate and simple mourning scene, one where an individual is brought before the representation of open light, perhaps even the touch of something ethereal, if not divine, that the picture stages. Washington's ghost is never far from his embodied mourners, the picture implies. Contrarily, and despite his best efforts, the specter of John Fitch doesn't haunt the study of early National America, nor do the other figures I'll be discussing today. But perhaps in an ironic gesture, they might get their 15 minutes this day. The material for today's remarks derives from my forthcoming book, that reconceives the early Republic period of the United States by presenting the forgotten and queer stories of a series of marginal, even eccentric figures in the Republic of the United States. Much of US cultural production since the 20th century has celebrated the figure of the singular individual, from the lonesome Huckleberry Finn to the cinematic loners John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, but that that tradition casts a backward shadow that prohibits seeing how the singular in America was previously marked as unwanted, outcast, excessive, or weird. Feeling singular, queer masculinities in the early United States examines the paradoxical nature of masculine self-promotion in the early US, and in telling the stories of excessive masculinities, I depict a messy world of social outcasts and eccentric personalities all striving for some sort of recognition and failing spectacularly. Um, these figures include John Fitch, a struggling working class mechanic, um, and Timothy Dexter, a self-declared lord. Um, and I love a good epigraph. Um, so I wanted to have the, these quotes sort of like tether 
my talk. So there's quotes from uh, uh, Fitch, Dexter, and I'll conclude with John Filson. There is a convention in introducing lesser known figures who will subsequently receive the attention of a close reading to offer a brief biography with dates that plot the individual into linear time. But with the eccentricity of Dexter, my theme, I would prefer to begin in medias res, as it were, in 1793, about three years before the U.S. Constitution enabled Dexter to amass a large fortune through speculation when he stood atop a table on a small island in Massachusetts' Merrimack River and drunkenly celebrated his own public funding of a bridge. His particular inebriated toast for Newburyport's Merrimack Bridge gained the attention of regional newspapers, with the Newburyport Herald mockingly declaring, quote, the amateurs of taste were regaled with a beautiful oration in French delivered in a masterly style by the Honorable Timothy Dexter Esquire. This incoherent description challenges the comprehension of Dexter's performance. Although this account ironically calls Dexter's rambling mess truly Ciceronian, this event prompted the newspaper to humorously parody Dexter, reprinting his various public declarations with phonetic spelling and without punctuation. So despite the ironic truly Ciceronian moniker, Dexter already had his unconventional self presented in print a year before in a New Hampshire newspaper. Quote, in compliance with his request, the article begins, and to oblige the ingenious gentleman who is the author of the following lucubrations, they are inserted verbatim et literatum as they came from his pen. The text then asserts the sacrilegious, quote, the above is wrote at one o'clock at night, that this world is hell and all men are devils. Therefore, we free thinkers can't think no more of them than devils, only there is different sorts of devils. Declaring all men devils, these lucubrations offer a sense of imagined immediacy, the midnight thoughts of a free thinker with a vexed and curious tone, flaunting religious mores while also playfully appearing as an uneducated jokester. By the time Dexter had stood atop a table on an island in the Merrimack River, he had already made himself somewhat infamous for drawing attention to himself through such newspaper antics. Importantly, Dexter wished to build this bridge because he rightly guessed that the population of the town would soon double, and if he had a stake on the bridge, he could increase his wealth through a toll. In this sense, the tolled bridge would not simply benefit the town of Newburyport, but also encourage Dexter's own commerce, as his yard often displayed what newspapers called exotic curiosities, like an African lion in 1795 that visitors would pay to see. Very explicitly with Dexter, we see the figure of an individual who tethers private interest with public infrastructure, funding the building of roads and bridges that would enable his own economic development. Such dynamics are pointed out in several 1799 newspaper notices that thanked Dexter for his, quote, services pro bono public, which included paving the road from the bridge in town, leading travelers up to the fence of his property to gaze upon his curiosities. Desiring to make travel to Newburyport easier, he imagines how the funding of the bridge will facilitate his own money-making schemes with animal menageries and eventual statues drawing attention to his front yard as spectacle. Dexter had built a persona for himself through his own unusual uses of print and self-centered advertising. For instance, he had a picture of himself reproduced and then promoted its sale through dozens of advertisements throughout New England, noting, quote, this day published and for the sale of the bookstore of Thomas Whipple, this image done by actually James Aiken. Although Dexter himself dressed up in person uh, uh, and called himself a lord, he performatively dressed himself down in homespun dress in his curious textual legacy entitled A Pickle for the Knowing Ones or Plain Truths in Homespun Dress, published in 1802. Using no punctuation and disregarding the consolidating, consolidating norms of English spelling, the book complicates his quasi-aristocratic social persona, writing, quote, to mankind at large, Dexter opens his strange text 
by referencing statues he placed in front of his home on the first of the first three presidents of the United States. And I won't read it, but it's just, you can tell, I mean, he's just kind of like, he's using, words are using him and he's using words. Um, and he's describing the three, um, you know, kings that will be placed in front of his yard, um, Washington, Jefferson, and or Adams and Jefferson. Um, so Dexter's challenging prose attempts to model New England speech patterns, making intelligibility occur only through reading the syllables aloud. But this curious use of print also emphasizes Dexter's particularity, how even his speech patterns refuse to be abstracted out of the forms of print. Other brains grew in the yard of Dexter's mansion in the forms of wooden statues that stood as sentinels around his fantasy of being included in the myth-making production of the early U.S. These statues are interesting um, not as individual works of art, but in what they constellate as a fantasy of cultural celebrity. So here we have the Royal Arch with Washington, Adams on the left, and Jefferson on the right. Um, the artist, was his name was Babson. Um, and anecdotally, he wanted Jefferson to um, be holding the Constitution. Um, and the artist was like, no, he, uh, you know, he should hold the Declaration. And Dexter's reportedly um, fired a gun at the artist to say, no, I want the constitution on that. Um, so, um, but there's a there's just a profound incoherence to um, the mixture of figures from King George to George Washington and from Louis the 16th to Napoleon Bonaparte that suggests an impulse to cover all bases, as it were, all possible iconographic resonances of political celebrity circa 1800. This celebration of a figure on an elevated position, one that allows a sense of perspective that can foresee the future, constructs the government as a being as being a thing above the people, raised up on pedestals for the adoration of those below. Um, it is like a, and I argue in the larger project that Dexter is actually queering um, federalism in this manner, um, which I would love to talk about further. Uh, Dexter's imagined sense of political greatness and patriotical patriotic panache led him to put forward political antics that dovetailed with the new formations of speculation and celebrity culture of the Federalist United States. Um, and though his performances have vanished, they were mostly destroyed in an 1816 uh, storm. Um, their study occasions an opportunity to think about the disheveled monuments to eccentricity in the early U.S., and what to do with these aspirations to produce something. Dexter's perhaps most infamous moment of trying to see how he would be remembered occurred when he faked his death in order to witness his own funeral. We get a notice of this, and this is, you know, my, my Kentucky connection, so get ready, in a letter written by Horace Hawley to his fiancée Mary Austin, which simultaneously describes the odd statues that decorated Dexter's premises um, and describes this sort of like funeral st story. So after describing the house, Holly mentions Dexter, quote, immediately accosted us in a sort of soliloquy and in his own strange manner, putting his finger to his forehead said, nature, nature, I worship nature. Reason, reason is my God. The old man has not been well these days, lost a little strength, memory affected, head work gone, have done a great deal of head work in my day. Never mind. How do you like it? Will you show me much more? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. From this recorded gibberish, Holly then explains the scene of Dexter's planned funeral. And I won't read the whole quote, but just at the end, he mentions um, that he once caused himself to be put in his, you know, burial space to to see how people would mourn him, um, to see how people would. Um, articulate his loss. The story of Dexter's faux funeral circulated in the 19th century as a marker of his eccentricity, especially by writers of local histories. Um, I turn now to a bit of a longer quote to show how the lawyer uh, Samuel Knapp in his 1838 biography of Dexter describes this funeral scene with relish. Um, and I'll just kind of touch on the very end. Oh, um, where he just mentions um, Dexter had been so pleased in his concealment in hearing of his praise um, that he entered the wake room with the highest glee 
shared in the wine and threw small change from his window to the gaping crowd of boys who had gathered to witness the last solemn scene. Through considering this fantasy of Dexter's to witness his own posthumous legacy, I'm interested in thinking about the desire to control one's cultural reception. I am influenced by Carolyn Steedman's evocative description that the historian's, quote, craft is to conjure a social system from a nutmeg grater. And so I try to imagine the arbitrary and unformed processes that tether certain individuals to positions of power and legitimacy and others to aspire, however failingly and kind of like grotesquely, to such positions. And looking toward the recesses of cultural memory where Dexter's wooden fantasy of greatness festers and decays, one might consider the cultural work done through designating him as an eccentric and how that label would actually belie how forgetting, neglecting, and relegating certain cultural materials then craft a conception of a cultural field. What type of a society might produce a Timothy Dexter? And how does his production within the social mimic a series of social drives and norms that coalesce around such a figure of profound narcissistic drive? Desperate to write himself into the cultural imaginary of his moment, Timothy Dexter drew upon the iconography of the early Republic in order to position himself into its futurity. This is a quote from Michel Foucault, quote, as the, as the archaeology of our thought easily shows, man is an invention in his, man is an invention of recent date and one perhaps nearing its end. If only that were the case, as it seems now we have simply accelerated the tools to proliferate the male self, exasperating the conditions that produce the singularities that continue to demand and contain attention. That end of man appears nowhere in sight as the technology of self-representation proliferate and morph into new mediated categories of attention. Just as Dexter succeeded from being, in Foucault's term, erased like a face drawn in sand at the edge of the sea, the apparatus of his textual continuity relies on the interest his likeness and figuration poses within textual archives. Dexter, in this manner, merely used the technologies and cultural imaginaries at hand to levy himself into future remembrance. His life and writings provide a phantasm of imagined greatness that has much to say about a particularly American and dogged insistence on feeling significant. And I want to turn sort of with that to pivot to John Fitch. Um, so John Fitch and his fraught steamboat certainly dovetails with Dexter's aspirations to secure himself for future adoration, though perhaps exposes the more complex underside to such desires for a lasting legacy. Upon learning of his death, Fitch's few remaining friends proposed disinterring his remains and removing them to Philadelphia's Laurel Hill Cemetery, where a monument to testify to the mechanic's desire to be remembered could be erected. And this is this uh, proposed monument that never materialized. Um, his darling wish, he said, was to be buried on the margin of the Ohio um, and where the song of the boatman might penetrate the stillness of his resting place and where the sound of the steam engine might send its echoes abroad. The text from this failed monument, a never materialized witness to Fitch's failure to arrive at his fraught desire, which was to be recognized as an inventive genius, suggests a melancholic affect that sympathetically represents the struggles of a poor mechanic against a larger collective um, because he lost individual state patents at the Constitution signing. Counterposed to Benjamin Franklin's youthful and self-written epigraph, um, which you might be familiar with, Fitch seems far more anxious about his future's attenuated reception. Although ironically, Franklin's wish was materialized the printing and reprinting of his manuscripts into a book, Fitch could not even achieve his darling wish to have his remains settle near the Ohio River, much less to have his name proliferated as a famed inventor during his time. That the monument never materialized demonstrates the production of Fitch as a recovered failure, unable to be rescued from the obscurity of a Kentucky burial for a contemplated memorial in Philadelphia. And even the Latin 
which roughly translates into here is nothing more desirable to happen to me places in the past a places in the past tense a wish that remains unfulfilled more desires of fitch remain un unfulfilled uh crafting a textual life held in four manuscript books and preserved in the library company of philadelphia Fitch hungered after having his life transformed into book form. He wanted to achieve the social function of author, remembered as the writer of his life. He first began the manuscripts that have been assembled into his life writings in January 1790, writing, quote, John Fitch, his book at the top of the page, and dedicating the contents of the book to, quote, my children and future generations. Attending to these manuscripts, manuscript books, one can readily imagine Fitch reading and rereading his life narrative as we see the punctuation in his hand yet in different colored ink. Words, paragraphs, and sentences are crossed out and altered, and page numbers added with directions to jump ahead or go back for further elaboration on a point that, in his hurried hand, quickly turned into an unfinished tangent. The more recognizable figure who rose to prominence as a class ascending 18th century American, namely Benjamin Franklin, offered his written self as an abstractable equation for others desirous of such Republican significance. But instead of authoring his own life for print, like Franklin, um, who knew that at least the majority of his manuscript would be circulated if not printed, Fitch understood his future textual reception would require others' aid. He asked future editors to clarify his prose so that he could be understood by future readers. From the material manuscript, we know he deliberated over words and phrases, making emendations, and writing to the librarian who held his manuscripts, quote, as I am no grammarian, I wish the whole of my works revised, but not altered in substance. Wanting his book to be edited, but, quote, not altered in substance, he imagines his textual body could be cleaned up in the proper prose of his period, which he understood as a prerequisite to becoming important to future readers. Being, quote, no grammarian should have been one of the least of his concerns, but it expresses a sense of a social convention that he knowingly cannot rightly perform. So contrary to Dexter, who flaunted convention and broke all the rules in his print, Fitch desires to have his textual corpus be made into a form that he knows he cannot achieve, but yet he still understands as essential to his cultural longevity legibility. The other aspects of his writing um, that I might just touch on is that he thought that um, his book was going to overthrow the U.S. government. Like I'm not, he was like, if people read this, they are never going to vote for Thomas Jefferson. And guess what? They're going to hate Benjamin Franklin too. And like he thought he was writing this big expose. And so on the cover, he begged the librarian to preserve it for at least 20 years after his death. Because he was afraid if someone would read it, they would just burn it immediately. And it's really not that juicy. Like the guy just had a lot of like um, a lot of self-conceived notions of, of probably trauma that like infiltrated how we saw the world. Um, I want to think a little bit about how Fitch desires to place himself in this book form. He wants someone to pledge their honor to produce himself, and it doesn't happen, right? The book is eventually printed in 1976, but all of the curious spellings are retained because in the sort of lexicon of scholars, like we um, we live in, like we want that, right? We don't want things to be changed from the original uh, manuscript. So the fantasy of book form or the ideal of breaking the rules to become iconic like Dexter evaded Fitch, but others were able to have their life narrative circulate in pronounced ways. In the time remaining, I want to touch on one such figure who rose to the type of prominence that Fitch and Dexter aspired, which we've kind of talked about a little bit, and to think on the material text apparatus that helped facilitate that. Obviously, someone like Daniel Boone. The arbiters of cultural significance in the early United States certainly showed interest in finding a figure like Fitch who could stabilize the Republic celebrity culture, a galvanizing figure of sorts. Um, but you see this particularly in 
the formation of Daniel Boone through Filson. Um, so I want to just touch on the way that Boone first obtained textual celebrity through John Filson's The Discovery uh, Settlement and Present State of Kentucky, which included a narrative of the pioneer's life. Filson accompanied his book with a map of the area, as we, we've touched on today, a lexicon of the on-the-ground information for settlers, both along the Ohio River and into the hills of Kentucky, and then included distances between various cities in the middle of Kentucky. So the book had this aspiration to be deeply practical. Filson's book, however, functions as a settler colonial sales pitch, operating more as an advertisement for Kentucky settlement than a disinterested articulation of, as its title page declares, the topography and natural history of the important country. There is a disjuncture in the book's declared intentions and the operations of the actual content. Um, the late 19th century book historian and antiquarian, which uh, we all know, Reuben T. Durrett, describes Filson's book as, quote, a quaint leather-bound octavo of 118 pages, arguing that the title page is quite out of proportion to the matter which followed. It reminded one of a huge portico in front of a small house or a great door leading into a diminutive apartment. For Durrett, the book's prefatory material outshines its material content, functioning as a cumbersome entryway to the packaged ideology of Kentucky settlement, producing the fantasy of a large entryway even as the content appears meager. The book recalls to the mind a massive porch that invites, but in inviting, tries to obscure the diminutive apartment that is the interior. The book manufactures its own constructed worth through an excessive appendix that overwhelms the rest of the book, making that digestive supplement far outweigh the rest of the book, as if Filson may have begun with one idea, but the project ballooned to encompass more and more. There's something almost rapacious to the accumulation of detail and the collection of text that the text actually does. And an illustration that Filson drew of himself in the frontispiece of a favorite book, which Ruben T. Durrett, um, um, uh, like makes that claim, Filson appears with a high, shiny forehead, cavernous eyes, and a skeletal nose, resembling perhaps the future literary schoolmaster of Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane. As a bachelor, Filson appears to be an odd queer figure, calling for such desires for reproductive settlement made even stranger by a farewell poem that he, according to book historian Ruben T. Durrett, wrote about his refusal for domestic formations and desire for death. Uh, I'll just read four lines of this poem. It begins, adieu, ye limpid streams and cooling shades, adieu, ye groves, ye me meadows, fields, and meads. Adieu to all this scene and yon green bowers. Adieu to sweets and all this field of flowers. Eighteen lines begin with adieu, following the structure of heroic couplets, advancing a repetitive sense of goodbye that stumbles to a close. The white encroachment on land in Kentucky invites a type of goodbye, where individuals are tasked with the implicit obligation to justify their decision, to turn from their social belonging, and make contested claims to lands. In this unremarkable poem, the speaker jumps to his death to forget the pains of love. Repetitively severing ties with sociality, the poem offers a dissatisfying presentation of dissatisfaction, perhaps not dissimilar with Ray Tarada's sense of queerness as the rupture that suggests the given world could and should be otherwise. The poem then, becomes a strange monument to the failed production of lasting attachments, with the subject determining instead to cast himself, quote, in yonder gulf to end my pain. Filson, as we may know, has an unknown resting place and an unknown death date, but perhaps from those multi-pronged adieus, we catch a glimpse into the signifying abyss that swirls around the desire for lasting significance. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all so much uh, for the introduction and the invitation to speak. I'm, I'm so sorry not to be able to be with you today. 
Uh, I made it this long without COVID, but it finally came for me. It's it's never the right time. But again, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, rather to the organizers and to the audience for your patience and especially for the technology that will allow me to present virtually today. Um, I'm going to be discussing a somewhat overlooked historical footnote that I think will help remind us of some rather surprising French connections for the Ohio Valley. So to get things started, I wanted to begin with something close to home. Uh, many, if not all of you know that Louisville was first settled in 1778, uh, a year that also marked the Franco-American Alliance, secured through the efforts of, among others, Benjamin Franklin, and signed by Louis XVI. If we fast forward to 1780, the small settlement on the Ohio River was formally chartered and named Louisville in honor of the United Colonies' royal ally. At right, you see the city's modern day seal, which features that stylized lily, the fleur de lys, a royal emblem. Of course, Louis XVI himself met his end on the scaffold of the guillotine in 1793 but his name and memory endure in Kentucky. Commissioned by his one surviving child, a daughter, a marble sculpture of the king even made its way to Louisville, where it remained on view from 1966 when it was gifted uh, until 2020 when it was vandalized. And that's the image at center. I'm not sure what the current situation is with the sculpture, but uh, certainly an interesting case study uh, right there. There was a time, however, when images of France's last absolute monarch enjoyed a certain favor in the United States. Owned by George Washington, the engraving at right of Louisville's royal namesake survives in its original gilt wood frame. This is one of 20 such prints that were distributed as gifts to various American politicians by a veteran of the American Revolution, Ternon who arrived in Philadelphia in 1791 as France's newest ambassador. With pleasure, Washington wrote to the ambassador to accept, quote, the new and elegant print of the King of the French, uh, an important nuance because by this point, Louis XVI was no longer King of France, but King of the French. There was a constitution. Washington accepted the print as a mark of your attachment to my person. You will believe me, sir, when I assure you that I have a grateful and lively sense of the personal respect and friendship expressed in your favor, which accompanied the print. Washington, of, Washington afforded the print pride of place at Mount Vernon in the new room specifically, but this was not the only image of a French king offered to him as a gift. In 1786, five years before, a letter from the French artist and draftsman Charles Cosette reached Washington at Mount Vernon. In his note, Cosette described how in 1763, the Royal War Department at Versailles had commissioned him to create an equestrian portrait of Louis XV. Unlike his grandson, Louis XVI, Louis XV lived and died an absolute monarch. He was himself the, uh, the great-grandson of Louis XIV. Louis XV ascended the throne at the age of five in 1715 and died of smallpox in 1774. Gosette's finished painting at right depicts the king giving orders during the War of the Austrian Succession, known as King George's War in America among Anglo-colonial people, uh, in the mid-1740s. And this was when the king's popularity and overseas empire were at their height. Cosette proudly explained that he wished to present Washington with the preliminary sketch of the painting. This was as a token of his honor and esteem. However, sending both respects and regrets, the future president replied, Sir, I am highly obliged for the compliment which you pay me in desiring my acceptance of a portrait of Louis XV on horseback. I join with you in wishing that it might be placed in some public and conspicuous situation where the world could be gratified by seeing the picture of a good king and where the merit of the performer meet with the applause which is due to it. Ever the diplomat, Washington continued, I must beg leave then to decline the acceptance of it 
as it could not here be placed in that conspicuous point of view which would do it justice. Washington's tactful response, or rather excuse, was that there simply wasn't enough space on the wall, or at least a suitable one, for the image, uh, for Quisette's gift, which is not known to survive. Privately, however, he may have harbored slightly different thoughts about the suitability of the likeness itself. It's a little hard to reconcile conspicuous display of Louis XV's image at Mount Vernon alongside Washington's portrait by Charles Wilson Peale. Hung in the front parlor, this is an image we saw yesterday. Peale's 1772 portrait is famous as the earliest known representation of Washington known to have been taken from life. And again, as we heard yesterday, he appears not as a revolutionary or a president, but as a proud British subject and a provincial officer, dressed in the blue and red uniform of the Virginia Regiment. This same colonial unit had been raised to fight against French imperial ambitions in North America during the French and Indian or Seven Years' War, a global conflict that Washington himself is sometimes often credited with starting. The short version of the story is that the French had positioned a series of engraved lead plates or plaques at various points across the Ohio Valley in 1749. On screen is the only known intact plate to survive. It was found in what is now West Virginia in 1846 and given to the Virginia Historical Society in 1850. It measures about 11 by seven and a half inches. So think about piece of printer paper. It's a little difficult to see, but there are four fleur de lis at each corner with three at the top. The inscription, which is in French, reiterates French possession of the territory in the name of Louis XV. It's kind of a fill in the blanks situation uh, with the specifics of where the plate was left or buried and when uh, added on the spot. And so you can see the kind of thinner inscription at the center. I don't know if my cursor is going to work, but it's that, that slightly um, thinner lettering at the center. I'm gonna spend more time thinking and talking about the lead plates uh, with you all today, as well as the people involved. Um, but uh, to again, set the stage, the plates themselves did help inspire action by Virginia's colonial governor, uh, Robert Dinwiddie, who in 1753 ordered an expedition led by none other than Washington, then a 21 year old officer. Uh, and this was to what the British considered part of Virginia. Washington undertook a second expedition in the summer of 1754, whereupon he met up with a largely French Canadian force. A skirmish ensued in what is now Western Pennsylvania, ending with the death murder of a Canadian officer, Jumonville, by Tanagrisson, who was a Seneca warrior, also known as the Half King, uh, and who was himself helping to lead Washington. So this is as much a story of imperial ambitions and claims as it is uh, indigenous diplomacy and, and agency. Washington unknowingly admitted blame for Jumonville's death and others in a capitulation statement, uh, which had been written in French, a language he could not read himself. So not his finest hour, but the unexpected beginning of a much longer uh, military career. Of course, the Jumonville affair um, is easily overshadowed by Washington's later, more triumphant uh, career uh, and legendary life. Likewise, his polite refusal some 30 years later of an engraving or a drawing depicting an enemy French king is easily relegated to the realm of the anecdotal. But what about the lead plates? They are exactly the kind of thing that so interest me precisely because they encourage us to consider a wider, more holistic image of early America. And many of you are probably familiar with the idea of a vast early America uh, coined by Karen Wolf. Um, in this case, the vast early America, the image uh, at heart of this is that we are thinking and looking at people who spoke French and belonged to a larger French empire that extended from Canada to the Caribbean. With or without engraved lead plates to remind them, Anglo-Americans like Washington were all too aware that they had French-speaking Catholic neighbors at their borders. 
We had a great talk yesterday about cartography as colonial fiction, but I think it's still worth taking a look at these maps to help us get situated. New France, as France's North American empire was known, was first claimed in 1534. At its height in the 1750s, New France stretched from Labrador across the St. Lawrence Valley, the Great Lakes, down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. Quebec, the, uh, the fortified capital of New France, founded in 1608, uh, preceded the fur trade hub of Montreal, which was founded in 1642. Forts and trading posts were founded around the Great Lakes and in the interior. Louisiana's capital of New Orleans, one of the last urban settlements, was founded in 1718. We also have St. Louis, Missouri, actually established by New Orleans merchants in 1764. And this was before news had reached them of France's defeat in the Seven Years' War. At the time of its fall, New France boasted a colonial population of about 55, 60,000 people. Um, compare that to the approximately 1 million who called British North America home. In accordance with the 1763 Treaty of Paris, 260 years ago and a week ago last week, uh, France renounced almost all of its North American empire. So that's the map on the right. We see Canada and Spanish Florida have become the British Empire's newest American colonies. Uh, among my many soapboxes, there never were 13 colonies, just 13 rebellious ones, and not until 1776. That was not something people conceived of until that moment in time. Uh, Spain took New Orleans and Louisiana west of the Mississippi, with France allowed to keep two islands off the northern coast of Canada, uh, and its Caribbean colonies. Canada itself was famously dismissed by Voltaire as nothing but a few acres of snow. Things were very different, though, in 1749, which is where I want to spend most of our time today. Uh, in 1749, it was anyone's game, and no one could have foreseen our maps being so drastically altered in 1763. With respect to the lead plates, I want to reiterate how hotly contested the Ohio country was uh, in this mid-18th century moment with French, British, colonial, and Native Americans uh, wrestling each other for control. With respect to the French, the region's appeal was twofold. First of all, imperial forces wished to maintain monopolies on the lucrative fur trade and maintain alliances, again, with native peoples through trade, political, as well as economic alliances. Uh, the French also knew that keeping the British hemmed along the Atlantic seaboard was a means to thwart their expansion further west, possibly towards an as yet undiscovered route to Asia. So here enter the lead plates. We know that in June of 1749, an expedition that ended up lasting five months was ordered by France's acting governor, who you see at right, the Marquis de la Galissonnière. So as to bolster French claims along the Allegheny and Ohio rivers, which they actually thought was one river, uh, uh, the governor and his men ordered that engraved lead plates be strategically deposited at various points along the river and various tributaries um, so as to claim the land for Louis XV. Um, it's one part expedition, one part invasion, depending on who you ask. The plates themselves were presumably fashioned in Canada. I have not yet come across any documentation with respect to their place of manufacture, but they were certainly the kind of thing you could create in a colonial context. What is known, however, is that six plates were buried at various points in the summer of 1749, often near a tree or other natural feature uh, to which a metal sheet or plaque was affixed um, bearing the royal arms of France. Only two of the six plates are known to survive today, but various antiquarian sources do refer to others that were discovered and then subsequently lost over the years. Uh, erected in 1994, the historical marker at left refers to the plate that's now at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, which I showed earlier, and which is the only intact plate known to survive. The, uh, the French inscription notes its burial at the junction of the Kanawha and Ohio rivers, today known as Point Pleasant, 
Um, I've been told that West Virginia would really like the plate back. Um, but here you see a translation in English of the original French that you could see on the, uh, the overall image I showed before. What's really interesting here is that care was taken to, again, really spell things out uh, on the plate with references made to the Treaties of Reisvik in 1697, the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, and most recently, the 1748 Treaty of aix la chapelle These treaties concluded wars that pit the British against the French in both Europe and North America. So someone was definitely keeping score here. Uh, with each of those aforementioned conflicts and treaties um, having a colonial parallel. So you might know King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, all of which helped kind of set the scene for uh, the Seven Years or French and Indian War that arguably began in the backwoods of the Ohio Valley. Lightweight and portable, these thin lead sheets, these lead plates, offered a seemingly perfect solution in terms of laying both a claim and leading the way in 1749. But you might be wondering why go to the trouble at all. This might seem silly to us, but it was largely symbolic, uh, but no less potent a tradition that can be traced to the 16th century. We see here at left French explorers in present day Florida with the Tamuqua, standing before a monument erected by an earlier Huguenot expedition in 1562. Now in this 16th century example, the territorial claim had been made as much to establish um, a refuge for French Protestants as it was to claim the land for a Catholic sovereign. The, colonial, the colonists themselves were wiped out by a Spanish attack shortly thereafter. And the festooned column that we see here with the arms of France and the, and the crown was presumably destroyed. Ironically enough, the Florida chapters of the Daughters of the American Revolution erected a column of, the, of their own in the 1920s and commissioned a five cent stamp to commemorate this history in 1924. The idea here was to link Florida's French Huguenots to uh, with their co-religionists who were believed to have helped to found New York in uh, 1624. So Minuit, who purchases Manhattan, uh, was a, a Walloon, um, a, a Calvinist from what is now Belgium. Um, so an interesting historical link that is made there. In the 1680s, um, an expedition led by Cavalier de la Salle from Canada down the Mississippi River also relied on man-made signs to assert French imperial hegemony. La Salle's expedition, which began in 1682, followed on the heels of earlier reconnaissance undertaken in the 1670s. Reaching the Mississippi Delta in the spring of 82, La Salle is said to have erected a column or a pole and famously declared the region to be henceforth known as Louisiane, Louisiana, in honor of Louis XIV. The 18th century image at right both refers to and illustrates an event that took place in 1699, when the Canadian officer and explorer Pierre Lemoyne d'Iberville arrived in the region following La Salle. We see him recognizing La Salle's earlier column, which actually appears as a plate or a sheet, here bearing the arms of France and an inscription. Uh, in this case, the writing's on the tree, if not the wall. So that one's for Mark, a slightly different take on trees and texts. A souvenir of 1699 exists in the form of the Iberville Stone, uh, one of the Gulf Coast's earliest relics. This is a piece of marble that measures about 10 by 10 inches. It's dated 1699, uh, possibly served as ballast on one of the ships, and was found around 1910 uh, near Ocean Springs, Mississippi, Ocean Springs, Mississippi, near the site of Louisiana's first capital and permanent settlement, Biloxi. The stone's authenticity has long been debated, but it's a fascinating mystery. You can see this now in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana's a, a later colonial capital. With respect to our lead plates, though, in the Ohio Valley um, in 1749, these were preceded almost immediately by another expedition, this one much further afield. 
discovered by children playing in 1913. This lead plate was deposited by two brothers, François and Louis-Joseph de la Véronderie, near Fort, what is now Fort Pierre, South Dakota, along a bend in the Missouri and I believe the Bad Rivers. Um, and this was deposited in 1743. The two brothers had received instructions from New France's governor general and beforehand had traveled with their father to the Rocky Mountains. This marked the westernmost exploration of North America by any Europeans. When all was said and done, their journey had taken them to what is now, uh, what are now the modern day states of Nebraska, Iowa, Wyoming, both of the Dakotas and Minnesota, 60 plus years before Lewis and Clark. The La Véronderie plate is noteworthy for its inscription in Latin rather than French. We also see more of the fleur de lis, this uh, both in the corners and then uh, oh, in the center with the crown. It's a crude inscription, however, on the reverse that provides the specifics of its deposit, which is stated uh, to have taken place in September of 1743, not 1741, which is what we see here in the 26th reign of uh, Louis XV. In addition to the name of the older brother, François, we see the names of three witnesses. Again, this is on the reverse, which I, I don't have an image of. But we see the younger brother, Joseph, and then two men, Lalondette and Millon, whose names also appear on the back as proof of this was indeed deposited in 1743. Measuring six by eight inches, this plate is the only one associated with that, uh, with that westward expedition. So in comparison, and as I noted, in 1749, the lead plate expedition uh, in the Ohio Valley involved no less than six lead plates. I've shown the intact West Virginia plate, uh, slightly larger at 11 by seven and a half inches. At left is the other known plate. So there are two of the six that are currently located. Uh, really more of a fragment, however, and this example was found in 1798 in what is now Ohio on the banks of the Muskingum River at uh, near Marietta. It's believed to have been defaced by the boys who found it in the roots of an old tree. They were swimming and they found, they saw something sticking out of the roots of an old tree and were able to wrestle it from, from its prison. Um, whether that's where it was buried or if it had been washed away, there is some question. Um, land does change, topography, geography do are impacted and change over time. So whether that was the place of deposit is, is open for debate, but um, I'll get to, to more of that in just a moment. The boys who found the plate proceeded to melt portions to make bullets. So that's why we only have uh, this little section here. It was presumably the same size as the other plate, but a local historian who could read French got wind of the discovery and the plate ended in the hands of New York Governor DeWitt Clinton, who you see at right, painted by Rembrandt Peel. Uh, Clinton acquired this as something of a curiosity. He was a member of the American Antiquarian Society, which had just been founded in 1812. And so he donated the plate uh, the year before his death in 1828. Much of what we know about the lead plate's early history and, and that 1749 moment comes from journals kept by two of the expedition members, including a French Jesuit priest, Father de Buncon. Reputed as a mathematician and cartographer, Buncon made mention of the plates in his journal, published in 1897. He also noted where they had been buried on a map. In a somewhat ironic journal entry, he noted that they buried the second plate of lead under a great rock, upon which were to be seen several figures roughly graven. So there's not much in the way of uh, hard description there, but fascinating to consider how a French Jesuit might have compared French wayfinding to what were likely indigenous petroglyphs of an unspecified age. Um, I really love this 1980s postcard that you see at, at right, uh, depicts a 12 by 20 foot mural commissioned for the Wheeling Civic Center in West Virginia, it depicts one of the lead plate burial ceremonies. These were definitely celebratory in nature, uh, with gunfire, cries of vive le roi or long live the king, 
Um, it's an image that is certainly fanciful, but I'm so intrigued to see this history still shaping local memory as late as 1981. We see Buncon at right, this is the priest. At center, however, leading the expedition is a military man, Pierre-Joseph Céloron de Blainville, looking like he has just stepped out of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Born in Montreal in 1697, Céloron, or Céloron, was not a metropolitan Frenchman, but a Canadian, not known to have ever left North America. And I make that point about Celeron's Canadianness because I think we so often flatten the identities of these non-Anglo colonial figures, referring to them as French or Spanish or Dutch, regardless of whether they were Creole or colonial born or had even ever visited their mother country. On the basis of culture, food, dress, even language, Canadians distinguished themselves from their metropolitan kin and vice versa as early as the 1630s. That's not to say that Canadians didn't see themselves as part of a larger French imperial project. Indeed, Celeron was the son of a minor French nobleman, an immigrant himself, uh, who rose the ranks to become an officer in the French colonial troops. He served as commandant at Niagara and Detroit, and in 1738 was made a Knight of Saint-Louis, Saint Louis, this is an honor mentioned yesterday, a military honor awarded by the king. In many ways, however, Celeron lived between two, if not three worlds, French, Canadian, and arguably Indian. In his journal, Celeron revealed that the expedition often experienced the difficulties of what was an otherwise arduous journey, mostly by canoe. And I, I've, I've seen accounts of about 30 or so canoes, um, mostly in terms of how they were traveling when they weren't um, carrying these overland. Celeron also alluded to the challenges of Franco-Indian diplomacy with the Shawnee and Haudenosaunee or Iroquois largely unfavorable. Changing tides would eventually shift these groups predisposition to the French over the British. Um, but that's not to say that Celeron was wholly unprepared by what he found when visiting different villages and courting would-be allies. And I, I didn't mention, but at left is the French castle, the kind of the headquarters of the French at Fort Niagara that Celeron would have uh, would have seen and perhaps uh, will likely spent several nights in as commandant, which survives today. I've never been, but it's on my list of places to go. 1749 was not Celeron's first rodeo uh, with respect to the Ohio country. He had traveled through the area a decade before in 1739, accompanying his friend and fellow Canadian, the Baron de Longueuil, while en route to battle the Chickasaw in what is now northern Mississippi. Standing today in Jamestown in Chautauqua County, New York, uh, the historical marker at left relates some of the facts, including how Longueuil traveled together with a mixed Franco-Canadian Indian force. The records now at the French archives break things down, revealing how Longueuil led the detachment of 442 men, which in addition to other officers like Celeron, included a corps of cadets, regular soldiers, some 45 Canadians, and 236 Iroquois, 34 Algonquin and Nipissing, and 49 Abenaki. Non-combatants included a chaplain for the French, two more for the Indians, an interpreter, and a surgeon. Another 30 Mohawk, 40 Onondaga, 40 Seneca, 20 Oneida, 30 Shawnee, and four Abenaki joined this army as it traveled south in 1739. The lead plate expedition of 1749 was equally diverse with Celeron accompanied by um, eight officers, six cadets, a chaplain, 20 soldiers, 180 Canadians, and about 30, 50 Indians, mostly Iroquois. The extent to which Canadian officers like Celeron fraternized with their Indian allies during campaigns, I think helps us understand the forces that shaped his 1749 lead plate expedition and its larger goals. On that note, I want to recommend two books, uh, Christian Crouch's Nobility Lost, French and Canadian Martial Cultures, 
Indians and the End of New France from the from Cornell, published in 2014, as well as Sophie White's 2012 Wild Frenchmen and Frenchified Indians, Material Culture and Race in Colonial Louisiana from the University of Pennsylvania. These are two of my favorite books. Uh, they're always on my uh, my nightstand. Um, and they really get at some of these themes, very different approaches from uh, the material culture perspective to the more historical or text textual perspective. Um, but again, that, uh, I recommend both of these if you'd like to get a better sense of the larger context and, and um, the background of some of what I've been sharing today. As mentioned yesterday, uh, French colonial and Canadian officers alike might sport native tattoos. More than a few spoke indigenous languages, engaged in relationships with native women, and even underwent ritual adoption. These experiences in turn shaped their identities both on and off the campaign trail uh, and at home. For example, in 1749, the Swedish botanist Per Kalm visited Montreal, where he lodged with none other than Longueuil, who you see at the center. Kalm's account of his travels through North America uh, are rep is a replete with interesting anecdotes and impressions of the people he met, including the Canadians. In Canada, Kalm noted long-standing interactions with native people, writing, the French in Canada in many respects follow the customs of the Indians with whom they converse every day. They follow the Indian way of making war with exactness. This phenomenon was not limited to military men who served alongside Indian allies. In a more explicitly gendered passage, Calm declared Montreal women, like Longueuil's daughter-in-law, seen it right, as being accused by the French, these are metropolitan French officers, of partaking too much of the pride of the Indians and of being much wanting in French good breeding. Cultural slippages are alluded to in other sources, including the letters of Madame Bégon to her son-in-law, Michel, a colonial official, French-born in Louisiana. Now, I wrote my dissertation on Madame Bigon, who was herself born in Montreal in 1696 and moved to France in 1749. Uh, relatives who lived in France, upon meeting her, described her as an Iroquois woman. So there's a lot going on there and a lot to unpack. I'm, I'm a little obsessed, but I, I'm thinking a lot about it. Madame Bigon knew everybody in New France, uh, everyone worth knowing, at least, including Longueuil, uh, who noted, uh, rather she noted that he only loved his Iroquois. She likewise knew and counted Celeron among her friends, noting that he visited her every two weeks or so before he left on the lead plate expedition. In December of 1748, Madame Bégon described Celeron's fine singing voice at a dinner where he, Longueuil, and another officer sang so well that passersby stopped at the window so as to hear the music, which lasted until 11 o'clock at night. Madame Bégon did not note the nature of the singing that took place that night, but did tell of another example or another episode of table singing that took place a few weeks later. The occasion was a supper and ball hosted by Longueuil, during which time diners sang Indian songs at the dinner table before proceeding to dance the minuet. Some were so drunk with wine, however, that they apparently danced the dance with great difficulty. A week later, and one of Celeron's fellow officers, Nouillon, was so inebriated that he fell while dancing his minuet, his wig on one side and him on the other. Perhaps not as painful as the scalping described by Leah and Myron yesterday, uh, today and yesterday, but no less embarrassing. Noyon was actually the third officer singing songs at that first dinner party with Longueuil and Celeron. So they all knew each other. Like I mentioned, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about these episodes and how singing, dancing, and drinking figured in these kinds of cross-cultural entanglements, diplomacy, and the formation of Canadian identities. Uh, the article is in the works, so please stay tuned. But I mentioned all of this now because I believe they lend another dimension to that lead plate story and to Celeron, the man so firmly associated with their history. 
as the saying goes, in small things forgotten. Yet the legend of the lead plates has endured to this day. The search for the missing plates also continues. So if you know of any or find one, please let all of us know. We'd love to find at least one more. We could be 50-50 as opposed to two out of six. Pending the uh, missing plates discovery, uh, their legacy certainly lives on in the form of historical markers uh, that dot various locales across New York and the Ohio Valley. Uh, the lead plate ceremony, I should add, was reenacted in Pittsburgh in 1916 as part of a pageant and mask of freedom. Uh, the script is available on Google Books and is quite, quite interesting. Um, the lead plates were even celebrated in music. I'm not going to sing, but uh, the lyrics are on screen uh, and they come from the aptly titled, if not misspelled, Celeron song, uh, uh, either written by or at least recorded by a Pennsylvania folk musician, Robert Schmertz. If you didn't know about Celeron before today, you certainly do now. Hopefully, you also know that he was neither French, nor would he recognize the French tricolor flag or Republican national anthem, seeing as how he died in 1759. However, he was certainly one of the many French-speaking people to leave their mark both on American history and the American landscape. Today, I hope to have made a case that Canadian history is American history. By the same token, French is an American language. And I, I hope that you've enjoyed this overview of a surprising, perhaps even humorous series of events. I will go ahead and end there, but welcome any questions or comments, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. What's the, what's the process to then kind of prove that they're there um, later on, at least as the yeah. So in terms of finding them, I mean, I know that there have been some sort of uh, kind of basically amateur sort of um, metal detection, you know, that's that's one option. It's going to be very hard uh, because they will pick up all kinds of metal. Uh, you might find something else, which is maybe exciting. Um, the uh, if we look at the journals, they do mention the the spots, and so we can kind of pinpoint. But what is interesting is that, as I mentioned, the courses of the rivers and again the land changes. So, you know, you might go to the exact spot one of the plates was buried, and it won't be there anymore. Um, you know, I, whether that's natural or someone else has gone through, and we didn't have the luxury of someone writing down in a book that they found a, a weird thing in the ground. Um, but yeah, in terms of the process of finding others, um, there was a guy who thought he had one, but what it was, was a reproduction his parents had acquired somehow. Um, it was determined not to be one of the plates, but rather a reproduction, kind of, um, an inspired copy of the Virginia Historical Society plate. Um, hopefully that answered the question. I think it's going to be a lot of dumb luck, but you never know, so... I think a weird thing in the ground is a good title for the panel. Um, uh, Philippe, I, I had I have a question for each of you, but I can't make them synthetic for some reason. Um, maybe because we're at the last of all things. But um, Philippe, my first question is for you. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, you. You had checked my name, checked my my own paper about the kind of writing in the tree, trees and texts, and. Um, there's all sorts of writing around, under, on, beneath trees and roots and so forth. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit, as you did so briefly, and maybe dilate on it a little bit, about um, the kinds of ins indigenous inscriptions that Celeron would have encountered and the way in which you see um, contemporaries of, and including Celeron, thinking about the relationship of his artifacts of writing alongside these other inscriptions that were so often termed Indian writing in the period. And if you just riff on that, to keep a riff going. Um, and while you're thinking on that, uh, Ben, I also have a question for you, um, which is, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the relationship of your source materials, that is the material texts 
that you're working with and how uh, each of these singular figures relationship to manuscript and or prints um, unsettles our understandings of how people thought and theorized federalism as you invited us to think about uh, together. There. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It could be a dissertation for sure. I, to be honest, have not thought too deeply about it, um, mostly because I, I don't necessarily want to suggest that there's a one for one uh, parallel besides the kind of artificial application of something to the surface of a natural feature. Um, what I know a little bit about kind of petroglyphs in general is that, you know, the the understanding seems to be that they're often related to cosmology and and this is something you see across the world it's it's and across north america you see it in nova scotia the Mi'kmaq do it you see it here in new england um i almost killed myself looking for some petroglyphs in vermont about a year ago which was kind of fun those were actually uh recarved a little bit by later antiquarians who were interested in them um but they had been known since the late 18th century actually it was um ezra styles from yale who had gone up to go and document those in uh, his own work. When it comes to the actual, the 18th century, the, the French colonial understanding of those, I I don't really know. Um, I'm, I assume, and especially because it's the Jesuit who mentions them, that he sees them as something probably suspect and um, superstitious in a way that, you know, um, was related to paganism and, and uh, the perceived barbarity of these people in in his eyes as a European observer. Um, but um, I, I know there's a larger history of, of I, I think in California, there are some trees that have Native American inscriptions of such. And I was also thinking about not related to what you mentioned, but in terms of uh, at Roanoke, leaving the, the CRO for Croatan or whatever on the tree when the lost colony disappears. And so um, this larger tradition of of wayfinding and uh, communication. Um, so I, I really enjoyed your paper uh, with respect to kind of really sitting with that and reflecting on it. Um, I wish I had a better answer, but it's a no, good, no. I mean, good question. my question, my my question was invested in just other set of colonial understandings of indigenous inscriptions, maybe along the lines of writing, maybe not, but yeah. Certainly, I don't mean to task you with no, no I, understandings of those categories for the no, purposes of this brief. So, no, that was lovely. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. Sure. Great. Well, and I might... So, thanks for your questions, Mark. Um, it's always delightful to think with you. I find myself returning to the trope synecdoche, which is a part for a whole, or metonymy where a part stands in for a whole. In my work, as I, as I think about the ways in which we use representation to signify something else. Like, w why is it that we're, I mean, you know, I think that's the, maybe that's the problem of, of thinking is we're trying to find something to represent something else. You know, we want to know, like, how does Daniel Boone represent America? You know, and like, we want to figure that out. And um, I think in my work, I'm trying to show how that's actually impossible. And it requires a lot of, myth production. And I do that through looking at really singular texts. Like I look at a, a life narrative. There's only one remaining copy published in 1790s by this uh, kind of queer peddler itinerant poet named Jonathan Plummer. Um, and there's no way to really enfold him into some larger already understood or agreed upon story of America. Um, but his eccentricity like does something um to understanding this aspiration to be representable right so uh, to go to your question mark i i i look at very particular material texts and think about the inability of them to circulate so like john fitch's inability to actually get his book into a form that could be read is really interesting like that tells you something about this desire to be well known, to 
be a metonymy to stand in for something else that I kind of feel is is part of um, the problem of American culture, perhaps. I guess is my 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 post lunch um, meditation. But thank you for that question. I know you want. I want another one of those spinach rolls, but <laughs> those were really great. Thank you guys both for for some excellent papers. Um, then I'd like to ask you a question. Um, you and I talked a little bit about Fitch last night, and um, Mesa has kind of recently did an exhibit on maps, and we had the opportunity to show John Fitch's map. And so I wondered if you wouldn't mind kind of putting that within the context of your paper and your argument. Yeah, totally. I mean, so his map is of the Northwest Territory. It's a, a sort of massive undertaking. Um, I don't, I don't know, like how he assembled it, but I know he was a surveyor. Um, he was also a silversmith. Um, he uh, did a lot of things. Um, but I, his map, I, I would say that John Fitch provides an interesting perspective into um, thinking globally in the 18th century, um, because in his life narrative, he discusses um, going to Spain to try to get the Spanish crown to um, to uh, support his steamboat. This is like, and then he goes to France um, right at 1793. And we know what happens in 1793. So not successful with getting um, attention for, for his steamboat. Um, he writes that he would he would go to the day of Algiers if he would get um, some some funding. So Fitch, it's like he's he sees that other people have power that could support his idea, and he's willing to kind of do whatever to make it happen. So I, so I think in that the idea of him designing a map in the 1780s um, sort of shows him thinking. He's he is thinking uh, about like gl like larger global structures that he could attach himself to to um, win like get legibility, and so I think in in his making that map in the seven it's it's no wonder he's making this map in seventeen eighty four I think or eighty three like it's it's um, you know but it's all basically like it's it's not supposed to be part of the the U S right it's actually like um, it sort of, it accidentally becomes part of the U.S. in the sort of accident of, uh, not accident, but the 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 violence of settler colonialism. Right? It's a I, there's nothing inevitable to it, but Fitch is on that project of trying to um, further, you know. But I don't think he's doing it for like the American Republic. I think he just sort of wants to sort of attach himself to something that will give him attention. So. Mm -hmm. Let's all go on a steamboat ride. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've uh, got, I'm, I'm really glad, Philippe, that you, um, am I muted? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, we saw something come up on our screen. Um, I'm really glad that you led off with the uh, the Louis statue here in Louisville. I, I remember uh, the morning after uh, its hand was broken off and the, the start of its graffiti um, was was put on in 2020, um, I you know, it would, it was my habit that summer to wake up very early and get on Twitter and see what had happened overnight, um, in, in the protest downtown and, um, you know, sort of learn what state the city was in. Um, and I remember, uh, there was one of the bourbons, like a, a bourbon prince, um, you know, the current, you know, Duke of whatever, um, who is the, the, you know, the, I don't know, the, the, pretender um right now living in, in versailles i guess uh you know 
not in, but around, um, had had tweeted some demand to the city of Louisville to restore his family's honor and uh, uh, and and repair this statue and how dare they let it be. And um, I remember thinking, one, God, you're still around. Two, who gave you Twitter? Um, and and three, I enjoyed for the next um, you know week. Um, all of social justice Louisville, like dunking on this French prince um, for like, maybe you should stay in your lane right now, bud. <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, you asked about the statue. It is, it is in limbo right now. There was actually a little bit of a flurry of public art activity uh, here a couple of weeks ago where there was some uh, reporting on, you know, will the the mayor spend the funds to restore and replace the statue? There's no particular call for it. Um, they've offered it around to a number of, uh, you know, uh, cultural institutions. Nobody particularly has the room for a monumental Louis um, in their storage or exhibit spaces. Uh, and so he is he is sort of in limbo. But um I think the that moment of it being a, a site of protest against, um, you know, authority, you know, sort of in general, right, hierarchy and, and aristocracy and all of these things as as they were seen in the midst of 2020 is a fascinating twist on uh, the memory of the French connection here in the Ohio Valley. Um, so I don't know if you've got uh, any other uh, interesting examples of the way that this memory continues to be deployed in interesting ways um, in North America. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I'm always struck uh, when I see the fleur de lis kind of used because in France it's you know it's a royalist symbol, and if you put that on your backpack, you might get some, or you know you have a bumper sticker, which you never would have a bumper sticker in France. But if you put that on your car, or had it like a decal on your laptop, like you might get some some eye raising. So it's always funny, like in New Orleans, and as I, I've never been to Louisville, but I've seen uh, how that particular emblem has been used. And it's, it's funny, because like in Quebec, you know, it's on the flag. And that is also Canada is an independent nation, but it is a Commonwealth nation, it does have a now a king as its head of state. Um, there has been a separatist movement in Quebec for a while. But it's funny how those seemingly benign, pretty things you know do have real meaning um yeah i also saw that uh i guess it was 2020 this was the um he's actually spanish uh but he is the heir through the line of bourbons who went to spain when louis the 14th's grandson was was named king of spain and he officially renounced claim to the throne of france but he is considered by legitimist royalists as the heir to the now defunct throne, uh, his mother was a granddaughter of Franco. So there's a lot of um, a lot of baggage and a lot of layers in that particular royal's genealogy. Um, but but yeah, I, I, there's sort of I'm always thinking about the flattening of these motifs and emblems and images, usually commercial, usually very gimmicky, but but they do mean something and. Um, you know, we all want to kind of brand ourselves as unique or distinct, whether that's a product or a city or whatever. And so it is kind of funny to see that that French that French connection deployed in that way and, and reconfigured, reimagined um, with respect to the statue. I, I didn't I didn't do too much um, with it just to kind of kick things off, but it has kind of always been a contested statue. It was installed in 1829 in Montpellier, which is in the south of France. So it was only up for a few years before it was taken down with the the revolution of 1830. Um, it was given to Kentucky almost as an afterthought over a hundred years after it had, it had not been on view publicly in France for numerous reasons, because also Louis XVI is a controversial figure and putting his image up um, today is you know still politically charged in some circles it's kind of like in russia um although there's an interesting romanov revival and you see their name plastered everywhere and a lot of exhibits um but it so it remains very very topical very actual which is always interesting to think about but yeah the 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 french connection in the united states it's kind of a love hate thing too i think that certainly came out in the wake of 9 11 um but this was the first nation to 
you know, uh, enter into a political relationship with the United States. And uh, Louis the Sixteenth ultimately paid a heavy price for the money spent on that alliance in in many respects. So, it's it's interesting history for sure, and um, always interesting to see a local a local connection. And Louisville's is really um, unique in that respect. Um, yeah. Perhaps we could give it to Timothy Dexter. Um, I was going to ask, do you have any sense of who the artisans were who were making the statues? Um, yeah, j the name, Babson. Um, and I've done some digging around Antiquarian Society, um, Newburyport, Historical Societies, and can't find anything specific. But I do know before he died, he had in his will first that he was going to be buried, you know, on his property, but the city didn't allow that. Um, and he was going to have the statues made into mar like marble statues, basically. Um, but he died. And then the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the wooden statues ended up falling into disrepair. Thoreau mentions coming across like a portion of a statue once in, um, uh, I forget the essay now, but it's like, he just sort of is like, oh, how terrible. Like, this is like the fact that someone would ever do like make a statue of himself, terrible. So. <laughs> um, thanks, Philippe, uh, for that really fantastic uh, response. It it struck me as you were talking about the uh, the commodification of the fleur-de-lis are before uh, St. Louis got fancy and got an MLS franchise. Uh, they were the great soccer rivals of the Louisville soccer club, both of whom's emblems of course were fleur-de-lis. And, and so there was always this, this sort of banter back and forth between the fan bases and St. Louis always said, well, we actually were French. You all just stole the name. Like this is our thing. Give the, give the fleur-de-lis back. That's an aside. Talk about the arms of these statues shoes as the only things that remain i thought that was the most i don't know grotesque and fascinating um sort of remnants of those the detail on them was incredible the ruffles on the 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 uh shirts and the the ways at the elbow the fabric um pinched there was a lot of effort put into these again for for something that you would see at some distance I mean, he spent a lot of money on those. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean Dexter. Um, Dexter became wealthy through a chance speculation in bedpans that were sold to the Caribbean, um, but they were used to process um, enslaved labor sugar, right? Um, and the person who was, you know, convinced him to do it thought how funny, how gullible Dexter is that he would send warming bedpans to a, you know, a warm climate. But they ended up like being very successful. And then he um, amassed a whole bunch of whalebone corsets, like bought every single whalebone corset available, jacked up the price, and then sold them, right? So like a, a quintessential capitalist in the 1790s who's just amassing wealth while also sort of performing in this like um, this, this unserious pers persona that I, that I argue is actually like part of the game, right? Like he's acting foolish so that no one will question that there's an ulterior motive behind the decisions he's making, right? To create wealth. So, I, you know, and I would love to learn more about the artist, Babson. Um, it's been one of those things that I, I tried to find as much information as possible and ended up falling into just sort of like, local histories of the 1870s that referenced him but nothing like it'd be terrific to have something more um the james aiken piece james aiken famously has the that portrait of uh the picture of uh sally hemmings and thomas jefferson um so like he's a bit more famous so that and that image circulated all throughout new england for sale so and it looked from the photos that you showed that these are on display at the, the local museum or historical society or something, which I guess leads to this question about memory. How is he remembered locally and interpreted there? Is he Does he continue this legacy of sort of being a, a fun, weird, quirky sideshow? Yeah, totally just remembered as like, oh, that odd doc who had a hairless dog and wandered around this. Like, he's not read which 
he's not read in any kind of like male- I don't want to say malevolent, but there's there's an element in my reading of him that I think there's something actually like pretty destructive to what um what's going on with him. Um just if, from his personal life to his sort of public life. Um but yeah, it's there's been there's actually like a person writing a novel about him right now. Um I found through a blog maybe. Um, and like, I don't know what to do with it. Like, I kind of want to email him and be like, so what do you, and I have a, a dear friend of mine, Dan couch, um, has an essay coming out about punctuation and Timothy Dexter. So there's not, I mean, there's, there's not a ton of material, um, like scholarly material about him, but I think that perhaps like, um, he will be a chapter in my book. Um, and so, you know, I do think there's something more, to unpack with him so but yeah he's usually just sort of like cordoned off to a, a local history eccentric figure this question's for ben this might be a little out of left field um so i don't know if you've done any or if you found anything about dexter maybe having a larger impact in society with these patriotic outward facing um, components of his home. There's actually a move out off River Road, an 1850s facade. Uh, it's from you know several generations later, but it was a German immigrant who slathered the front of his house in Washington Jefferson patriotic. Um, it almost feels like it was probably armor, you know, coming in the late 1850s, the Know Nothing Party. But I don't know if you found anything that Dexter's eccentric, outward-facing patriotism might have actually be a legacy and made its way into the wider culture. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I mean, I think that there's something totally over the top about Dexter that resonate in this kind of like, let me tell you every, every opinion I have about like, about my perspective on the world is totally Dexter. Right. But there's something also just, um, I mean, there's Napoleon Bonaparte, and um uh you know king louis the 16th and there's george there's there's like a kind of like pro proliferation of figures so there's not necessarily a coherence to it but maybe that incoherence is actually kind of what that gesture of like excessive outward like patriotic uh celebration actually is it's a, and i like the idea of like a kind of armor a sort of like a thing that one puts on um, as a front. Um, and there's, I mean, there are like, you dig deep and then you realize like probably like there's a Timothy Dexter in every city in New England, <laughs> you know, like in some manner, there's a figure like him um, and Dexter just like happened to sort of like have access to a bit more of the materials to be preserved. So this is sort of a, a comment slash, once again, I'm sort of going with that, like, let's just riff rather than put thing, you know, putting things together. Um, Philippe, as, a, as someone who grew up in West Virginia, I had to smile about the lead plates being contentious with West Virginia and Virginia, because that was one of the key things we got in fourth grade West Virginia history. The lead plates were like our only connection to early America, and we needed them back. Um, so it does have regional resonance. So that that made me laugh a little bit. Um, but I was thinking about both of your your talks as having this really interesting element of kind of um, things that don't stay buried, right? And re-exhumation. And so I think going back to someone else's earlier comment for you, Philippe, about the, the lead plates and the role that these sorts of markers that are meant to be hidden do this kind of work of claiming land, but then the lead plates themselves are buried they come with the coats of arms, I guess, on the trees. So the coats of arms are the sort of actual signal like that you're going to see going down the river. But then again, sort of when are they supposed to be taken up out of the earth? When are we supposed to sort of actually see them and engage with them? And what happens if they're lost, which is what you're kind of talking about. And Ben, I'm just really obsessed with your characters. I feel like they're so fascinating. And I'm, I love someone's writing a novel about this. Um, Dexter's like, pretend funeral for himself. But then even I'm really fascinated by the layers with Fitch's failed um, memorial, right? Because you were saying that, correct me if I'm wrong, his friends don't actually get to do the thing in Philly for him, right? 
but even if they had succeeded, they would have actually, it sounds like undermined his own goals, right? Because he said he wants to be buried on the Ohio. So I would love to hear you talk a little bit about some of that. Like, what does it mean for, there feels like something like you're, you're thinking about kind of queer affect here and something about his failed desires for burial and then his friends efforts that are actually counter to his goals and desires. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that all kind of holds together, but I'm thinking a lot about things that don't stay buried. So. Yeah. I love that. Uh, do you want to start Philippe or. Sure. Um, can you hear? Yeah. I can see myself <laughs> twice. So yeah, thanks for the question. It's um, I feel like I have kind of a short answer and um, in the sense of just, we, we have to sort of take it seriously in the sense that they took these signs seriously. Uh, and it seems very tenuous and fraught and, silly and pedantic but these people did put stock even in this even if they challenged and contested it um you know the past is a foreign country it has different rules and different bylaws and we have to sort of go in with that context um but the fact of the matter is it, it is always challenged from day one we challenge it looking back with hindsight uh the the fortune of having that um but but yeah, I think uh, you know it, it sort of it exposes and reveals the kind of the fraught the precarity of these claims. Uh, again, the the talk yesterday on maps, you know, looking at those with a critical eye or five because they are a kind of fantasy and empire in many ways is a fantasy. You can be you can be at Versailles in the king's study, you know, looking at a map in the same way that you could be in your bathtub in Paris waxing poetic on civilization versus barbarity but on the ground it looks very different um sounds very different um you're probably not aware of most of what's actually going on on the ground but in that moment in time there is there is real stock and emphasis and weight placed on those outward symbols i think maybe something else kind of worth always keeping in mind is that you know we talk about self-fashioning and agency and it's like well in this period, you are there is a there is a social hierarchy, and there is some muddling, blending of lines, um, and that happens in these colonial contexts all the time. That's maybe perhaps the draw of a colonial life for people who are otherwise not making too many moves at home. Um, but but there is sort of an understanding that you are who you are um, with with some flexibility, but not as much as we certainly have today. So um, I hope maybe that kind of answered the question a little bit, um, because I think it, you know, when I go through the list, the chronology of a longer history of like putting up, you know, a sign, a sign rather, it's like, well, anyone can just rip that down, <laughs> but they're still doing it. So there is value placed on those outward symbols and signs, you know, there are royal processions through these towns in the early modern period that are meant to kind of convey the majesty and the authority and the power um, and I think we should put as much stock in that as we should in the personal and ceremonial meaning of like the tattoos, which are maybe not readily apparent to some onlookers, but mean very specific, very serious things to people from a different place. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, perhaps there, a, a day might have come where uh, they could have dug up all of those they would have become redundant because the map would look very different and we wouldn't need those anymore. Um, there is a Celeron street in Pittsburgh. So there are some funny, uh, funny ways that, that the history has kind of been turned on its head. Um, but, but again, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a different world and um, yeah. So thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, Marin, I love that question. That's such a, I, I love thinking about, how we find meaning through the things that we create or the things that we want to have meaning. Um, so things that don't stay buried in a way, it, it, like thinking, for instance, of like John Fitch, right? He was never forgotten. Like he's always actually been remembered by different people, but he's always been told that he's been forgotten. So he kind of like comes to symbolize the sort of, this every man a failure, like, oh, like how, how sentimental that, you know, this person was thwarted by the constitution. And what does that tell us about X, Y, and Z? But that circulates throughout Jacksonian America, throughout the 1850s, and then the 1910s, 
and the 1970s. And so there's there's an element of like this this circular logic where this this person like Fitch like eddies around the same thing. Um, so and and then the other thing I just want to throw out there is I'm really influenced by Susan Scott Parrish's um, sort of like res like reading against psychoanalysis for thinking about history where I'm so drawn to psychoanalysis. Like I am so drawn to like metaphors of repression, metaphors of like hidden desires, manifest. Like I find that a compelling thing, you know? And I think that says a lot about me than it says about the past in a way. But at the end of the day, I do think that there's something about the work we're doing to think about material culture in Kentucky that's that's going to be about um, ourselves. It's going to be about, you know, the moment that you're in. And so, yeah, maybe the thing that doesn't stay buried is like the thing that you attach yourself to. And maybe you're at, always trying to kind of negotiate that attachment in some manner. Um, but, and I think that an interesting little point to think about, and I don't have the, the tool, the where, wherewithal to do it, but you think about like Ruben T. Durrett being deeply attached to Filson for whatever reason and wanting to kind of like create an institution um, and producing like uh, a sort of being attached to the non-burial of Filson creates a sort of a figure for him to sort of like then build, like do some sort of institution building. Um, and so I'm rambling and I love that, but um, but I just, yeah. So I loved your question. I'm going to keep thinking about it. So that was like a, that was eddying into the abyss. Um, sincerely, I could keep this going for a long time. Um, I'm having so much fun. We are uh, almost to four o'clock. So if anybody does have some final questions, I, I welcome those or, um, I'm happy to to um, sort of wrap up and conclude and give everyone lots of thanks. Um, well, first, uh, let's have a round of applause for Philippe and Ben. And also to Scott for running the tech for this. Um, and, and again, you know, I'm really thrilled that we've got, you know, um, as many folks as we've had, uh, online last night and today, um, I'm thrilled that we have all of these recorded so that you all can come back and, and watch them. I'm looking forward to go back and, you know, go through some of these slides and replay some of these conversations, um, and think about, um, everything we've, we've drawn out here. Um, thanks to Daniel and Mezda. Uh, for being our partners in this. Um, thanks to Mac and Sharon, I know they left, but uh, for for uh, getting the Kentucky Collector community um, here to to come out and be a part of this and provide so much valuable perspective. Uh, you know, we were reflecting all, all weekend about how this is such an important intersection of knowledges and expertises. Um, and, and this really is, um, a, a sort of a crowning achievement of the, the sort of intellectual work that the Filson does. Um, so thanks to you all.